The Lord be with you. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, the beginning of a new year in the Christian calendar. The season of Advent, the four Sundays leading up to Christmas, is marked by waiting. Advent waiting might sound like salt in a wound this year. We have been waiting for nearly nine months, and it has been painful. Or Advent waiting might feel very welcome this year with its reminders of how God is at work in the waiting we have been doing, and it's pointing to hope. Neither of these is wrong or right, better or worse than the other. The Gospel of John says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture, because it reminds us that Christ is with us in everything we do. However, we might be experiencing Advent this year in our sadness, in our loneliness, in our depression, in our anticipation, in our waiting. No matter how you're entering into Advent this year, remember that we do so with Emmanuel, God with us. And now let's sing to the God who is with us. When I look around, I see shadows of weariness. So many people in this city and around the world are tired of sickness and evil and death. When I look around, I see shadows of injustice, the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer, everyone saying bye, bye, bye. And somewhere, someone wants to give up. In the face of weariness, we light a candle of hope. In the face of injustice, in the face of despair, we light a candle of hope. Let the light from this candle say to all that God's hope is coming on earth as it is in heaven. Friends, be not afraid. God's hope is at hand.
Emmanuel is with us wherever we are and greets us with these words. May the love of God the Father and the grace of Jesus the Son and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. We know that we are the church wherever we are, whether that is in the church building or in our homes or in our backyards. But we feel the pain of not gathering together in the church building. And community takes more effort when we are not in geographical proximity to one another. So I encourage you then to make connections and to build community with one another as you are able, whether that is through a phone call, a text, an email, or a socially distant visit. Repentance is another significant Advent practice. It's a way of preparing the way of the Lord in our own hearts. I invite you then to join me in this prayer of confession. I'll speak the regular type, and then I invite you to speak the bold type, either aloud or in your hearts. Let's pray. Triune God, we call out to you. Be the God we dream. You respond by being the God you are. We discuss you and define you and expect of you, but you unravel our expectations and definitions. We seek to limit and control, putting you in a box of our own making. You turn our boxes upside down. We seek now. You bid us wait. We seek obvious salvation. You send a child. We seek clear cut and easy answers. You give us hope. Turn our eyes away from the gold statues, our idols of selfishness and fear. Help us to let go of our expectations of you so that we might be ready to welcome the child who is on the way. Amen. Hear the good news of the psalmist proclamation. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to God and the night is as bright as the day. The God who has promised never to leave us or forsake us has come to us in Jesus Christ, who binds up the brokenhearted, heals all our infirmities, and relieves our burden of sin. Friends, believe the good news. In Christ you are forgiven.
response to God's grace to us, we give back out of what God has already given to us. We do this in this at-home worship time through automatic debits, through mailing a check to the church, through giving of our time or giving of the gifts and talents God has given us. As we give our offerings, we pray together this prayer. I invite you to speak the bold portions out loud or in your hearts. God, you have shown us the meaning of generosity in the beautiful diversity of creation, in the overflowing love of Jesus Christ, in the never-ending gift of the Holy Spirit. God, you have abundantly blessed us and called us to be a community that honors each other, to serve others with joy, to share our love and material possessions. We rejoice in what we have been given and in what is ours to give. Amen. We have the opportunity to bless our children as part of our worship and to receive their blessing as well. So please join me. People of God, what is our prayer for these children? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Don Penniman, one of the elders here at Sherman Street, and it is our joy and our privilege to join together in prayer. The elders and Pastor Jen, Pastor Tony are always available to join you in prayer. Please give us a call if there's anything on your mind, any concerns to be prayed for. And also give us a call with good news. We'd be pleased to pray with you and rejoice with you. Please join me in prayer. Our Lord, creator and sustainer, we come to you in a season of thanksgiving and a season of anticipation. We are thankful for our harvest season, for food on our tables and roofs over our heads. We are aware that there are many in this city and this world without these basic necessities. Guide this church, your church, in the continuing work of feeding the hungry and sheltering the homeless. We are thankful for the end of an election cycle, and we pray for an end to anger and hostility in the words of politicians in the words that are spoken on the street and written in social media and in all of our conversations. In the midst of the COVID pandemic, we are weary. We are weary of separation and isolation, yet we are thankful. We are thankful for physicians, for nurses, for first responders, and everyone who works in healthcare. We pray health, strength, and endurance as they work and pray that a time comes soon when they can rest. We are thankful for software engineers, web designers, technicians, and makers of computers and smartphones that have given us new ways to connect with each other in these unprecedented times. We are especially grateful for our brother Sam Smart and sister Rachel Roth for all of the hard work they do editing the videos to bring us our Sunday worship services. We are thankful for teachers who are continually learning new ways to engage students and for every parent and every kid who is hanging in there with their education. We are thankful for the children of our church. We are thankful that 
other people's children can be part of our lives and we can be part of their lives. We thank you for all the joy and new visions that they bring. Today we especially rejoice in the birth of Reuben John Scott Quakenbush and all the joy he's brought to the Vanderlyn and Quakenbush families. Today we begin the Advent season, a time that is both thoughtful and joyful as we await and celebrate your word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. Let us feel joy as each candle is lit and celebrate the light that darkness cannot overcome. Today we pray for our many members and many friends who are struggling with illness, with grief, and with hardships. We pray for our members and friends struggling with COVID. Maddie and Eli Jacoby, Ruth and Jim Padilla divorced, and many others. May their recovery be swift and may their energy return. We pray for Sarah Reenstra and Jessica Langley's friend who are struggling with pancreatitis. Pray for Miles Heisman, for Bonnie Mulder's sister Marcia, and for Terry Barnes. May their healing also be swift and may they be back to their regular lives very soon. We especially pray for those who've been struggling for cancer. We pray for continuing care and comfort for Penny Prime, Mark Prime, and Ellie Monspa, and a special measure of grace for Tom and Carolyn Wieda. We rejoice with Kimberly Belez and Andrew Prime with good news from their doctors, and we pray for Anita Umkus as she undergoes surgery this week. May surgery be successful, and again, healing be swift. In times of grief, we pray for Becky Vanderwerd's father and Stephanie Vanderzee's father as their health struggles in these times. We pray for Brenda Leggett and Willie Sawyer. May their home be repaired and renewed and they move back in to celebrate a Christmas season. As we pray, we pray as one small part of the body of Christ. Be with our brothers and sisters throughout the world this morning, wherever and however they are worshiping. Let us now go forward into a new week of work, of school, and of ministry with a sense of peace and a renewed sense of hope. Jesus' name. Amen. There are two Old Testament readings for this morning. The first is in Joel 2, verses 12 through 14. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. The second passage is also in Joel, but it's chapter 3, verses 17 through 21. Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy, never again will foreigners invade her. In that day the mountains will drip new wine, and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of Acacias. But Egypt will be desolate, Edom a desert waste, because of violence done to the people of Judah, in whose land they shed innocent blood. Judah will be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem through all generations. Shall I leave their innocent blood unavenged? No, I will not. The Lord dwells in Zion. This is the word of the Lord. Today's New Testament reading is John 9, 1 through 7. As Jesus was going along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Teacher, his disciples asked him, whose sin was it that caused this man to be born blind? Did he sin or did his parents? He didn't sin, replied Jesus, nor did his parents. It happened so that God's works could be seen in him. We must work the works of one who sent me as long as it's still daytime. The night is coming and nobody can work then. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. With these words, he spat on the ground and made some mud out of his spittle. He spread the mud on the man's eyes. Off with... Off you go, he said to him, and washed in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went off and washed. When he came back, he could see. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Good morning, Sherman Street. Uh, today marks the first Sunday of Advent and the first Sunday that our sermon series gets a little wonky. Uh, so we thus far have been going pretty much straight through the Bible and now we are skipping away from Old Testament history um, into the minor prophets. Uh, we're gonna do four prophets for Advent that deal particularly with longing. So today we're starting with Joel. Um, we're gonna do some other weird stuff through Christmas tide, uh, and then we'll get back to the history after that. Uh, all right, enjoy this Bible project video about Joel. The book of the prophet Joel. It's a short collection of prophetic poems that are both powerful and puzzling. Joel is unique among the prophets for a few reasons. First of all, there's no explicit indication of when this book was written. It's most likely the period of Ezra and Nehemiah after the return from the exile because he mentions Jerusalem and the temple, but there doesn't seem to be any kings. Also unique is that Joel is clearly familiar with many other scriptural books. He alludes to or quotes from the prophets Isaiah, Amos, Zephaniah, Nahum, Obadiah, Ezekiel, Malachi, even the book of Exodus. And this is connected with the last unique feature, and that's that Joel never accuses Israel of any specific sin. So, like many of the other prophets, he announces that God's judgment is coming to confront Israel's sin, but he never says why. And that's most likely because Joel assumes that, like him, you have been reading the books of the prophets, and so you already know all about Israel's rebellion. Now, altogether, these three features help us understand this fascinating little book, that Joel is a biblical author who was himself immersed in earlier biblical writings, and his reflection on them helped him make sense of the tragedies of his day, but also they gave him hope for the future. Let's dive in and we'll see how this book works. In chapters 1 and 2, Joel focuses on the day of the Lord. This is a key theme in the prophets, and it describes events in the past when God appeared in a powerful way to save his people or confront evil. Think about the plagues in the book of Exodus. But the prophet saw in these past events pointers to a future time when God would again confront evil among his people, but also among the nations and bring salvation to the whole world. And so here in chapters one and two, Joel has brought two parallel poems together that focus on this theme. So chapter one is about a past day of the Lord. He begins by announcing a recent disaster that a locust swarm has devastated Israel. And his description of the swarm recalls the day of the Lord against Egypt. Remember the eighth plague from Exodus chapter 10. Except this time, the locusts are being sent against Israel. And so Joel calls on the elders and the priests to lead the people in repentance and prayer. And then Joel actually himself repents along with all of the priests. Chapter 2 comes alongside, and it has the same poetic design and flow of thought. So Joel announces another day of the Lord, except this time it's future, not past. It's an imminent disaster coming on Jerusalem. And he begins describing what seems like another wave of locusts, but he uses military and cosmic imagery. So the locusts become God's army, like cavalry and soldiers that are marching and destroying everything in their path. And the sun is darkened, and the earth quakes, and Joel says, the day of the Lord, it's dreadful. Who can endure it? And so once more, Joel calls on the people to pray and repent. And he says how? To rend your hearts, not your garments, and return to your God. In other words, Joel knows that repentance can be just a show that you put on to get out of trouble. And he says God's not interested in that. He wants genuine change for his people to stop their selfishness and evil. And then Joel says why Israel should repent. Because God is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger and he's full of love. He's quoting here from the book of Exodus about how God forgave Israel after they made the golden calf. And from that story, Joel learned that God's mercy and love is more powerful than his wrath and judgment. And so he leads the priests in acts of repentance and prayer, asking God to spare his people. Then right after these two poems, the scene shifts, and we have a short narrative about God's response to the repentance of Joel and the people. So God was filled with passion for his land, and he had pity on his people. And then God says he's going to reverse the devastating effects of this day of the Lord and turn it from judgment into salvation. So first he's going to defeat the threatening invaders, which were presumably the locusts, and he's going to turn them all away to their own ruin. 
Then he's going to restore the devastated land and bring it back to life, making it abundant once more. And finally, God says he's going to bring his divine presence among his people. It will become real and accessible to everyone. Now, up to this point, the poems tell a powerful story about Joel leading Israel to see how their sin led to disaster and divine judgment and that with the God of mercy, there is always hope. But Joel sees in all of these past events an image of the future day of the Lord. And so in the final section of the book, Joel writes three more poems that match God's three-part response. And he weaves together images from other prophetic books and expands it all into a vision of hope for all creation. So first, the hope of God's presence among his people gets expanded into a promise about how one day in the future, God's own spirit, his personal life presence, will fill not just the temple, but all of his people. And here Joel is drawing upon the promises of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel that God's spirit would come to transform and empower his people so that they can truly love and follow him. Joel then picks up God's promise that he'll confront the threatening invader. And Joel sees in these ravaging locusts a similarity to the arrogant, violent nations of his own day that ravage and oppress people. And so he draws upon the promises of Isaiah and Zephaniah and Ezekiel about the future day of the Lord, when God will confront evil among all the nations and turn their violence back on themselves, bringing justice to right all wrongs. And finally, Joel picks up the images of the land's restoration, and he sees here a hope for the renewal of all creation. So he draws on the promises of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Zechariah that God's final day of justice will be followed by a restoration of the entire world, a new Eden, where God's presence in Jerusalem will flow out like a river and bring about cosmic renewal. And so Joel's poem ends with God's forgiveness and mercy opening up a whole new creation. And so this little book of Joel, it explores profound ideas about how human sin and failure wreak such devastating destruction in our world, about how God longs to show mercy to those who will just own up to their sin and confess it, and about how all of that leads us to hope that God will one day defeat evil in our world, but also inside of us, and bring his healing presence to make all things new. And that's what the book of Joel is all about. Those uh, Bible Project videos are so helpful, aren't they? Um, I am super grateful for them. Uh, Someone watched that one, the one about Joel, earlier in this week and then texted me and said, I just watched the video and now I love the book of Joel. (laughs) I asked them why. Um, And they said, it's like the whole message of the Bible in one little package. I thought that was great. Um, I did not tell her that at the time I was really struggling with the Bible Project's reading of the text. Um, Two things were bothering me. First, it talked a lot about how Israel was called to repentance. Um, And while I could see some hints of repentance there, it seems a lot more like lament to me. Like, take this, for example. Um, In Joel, uh, at the end of chapter one, the Bible Project video says that Joel joins in Israel's lament. Lament. that Joel repents himself, um, joining Israel in that. But listen to what the text says. It says, To you, Lord, I call, for fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness, and flames have burned up the trees in the field. Even the wild animals pant for you. The streams of water have dried up, and the fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness. That's it. There's no repentance there. Um... At least, I mean, it could be, but it seems just like he's asking for help. Um, And the text doesn't say the word repent anywhere, just things like weep and wail and declare holy fast. And those things could be repentance, but maybe not. Um, Plus, the truth is, I kind of wanted it to be lament because I'm not super comfortable with the idea that God sends calamity on us when we sin and then relents when we confess. Uh... I admit to my own prejudice in reading the Bible. Um, Anyway, the second thing I was struggling with was that uh, I wasn't really convinced that Joel was talking about a cosmic deliverance in the end. It seemed pretty local to me. Like you can read through the text later and you can see what you think, but uh, I just couldn't, I don't know, I was really struggling to get there. But in the end, I came around. Uh, I think the Bible project is right, or at least mostly right. But it took me a lot of reading to get there. 
uh, what helped me was that was discovering that a lot of scholars think that Joel is actually a liturgical text. They think it was used in worship, which makes a sense of a, which makes sense of a lot of things for me. Um, so it looks like if this is a liturgical text, Joel is using this past event that that already happened, a plague of locusts, and allowing it to be a metaphor for whatever pain worshipers might be facing in the present, allowing that past deliverance to assure them of the deliverance from whatever new trial it is that they're facing. Um, and that makes sense of the ambiguity between repentance and lament, because if they don't you know, say it outright as one or the other, then the worshiper can decide why exactly they need to rend their hearts. Is it because they're in deep grief about their circumstances or is it because they need to confess their sin or is it both? And it makes sense of why there's no specific sin named in the text either. Then the worshipers can examine themselves and confess whatever they might need. It also allows some mystery to remain about why a particular struggle has come. Are these terrible circumstances because of our sin or are they for some other reason? I think for lots of Christians, that question kind of lingers in the back of our minds, like, why do bad things happen? And it's a question that the Old Testament struggles with as well. There are lots of places where it seems really clear that if you do good things, God will give you good things. And if you do bad things, you will get bad things. But then other biblical, biblical writers ask questions like, why do the wicked prosper? And Job brings that question right out into the forefront. His friends try to feed him the math. You know, Job, sin means suffering. So you're suffering, so you must have sinned. Um, but Job, throughout the book, maintains his innocence. And in the end, God vindicates him, saying that his friends are wrong. Jesus does that same work of saying it's not that simple. In the text that we read this morning, people bring him a man who was born blind, and they asked him, ask him, is this man blind because of his sin or because of his parents' sin? And Jesus says, neither. He was, he's blind, it says, but for the glory of God to be revealed. And it's like he's saying, you seem to think that this is some punishment for him, but it's just the opposite. He is honored. It's complicated, you know? And that's our experience too. Sometimes, sometimes people do suffer because of sin. Like if you lie a lot, then all of your relationships will suffer. People won't feel like they can trust you and you won't feel like you can trust other people. You will feel lonely and afraid. It's a pretty direct line. Other times people seem to suffer though for no reason at all. Sometimes we need to lament, to complain to God. And sometimes we need to confess. And often we need both. Um, reading through Joel, uh, I was really struck by the first few verses because they seemed like something I have been saying a lot lately. The second part of verse two, so right at the beginning says, has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children. Let your children tell it to their children. Like whenever I compliment someone saying like, nice mask, I think like, oh, like who would have thought I would ever say something like this? And then I think I can't wait to read about how my kids' history books talk about this time. Has anything like this ever happened in your days? Of course, Joel is talking about a plague of locusts and we are in the midst of a plague of a very different kind. But I think the question still lingers, right? Like, why is this happening? Is it because of our sin? Is God handing out judgment? I actually think it's a really good question. Um, of course, I want to say like, no, that's silly. Um, but also the way that we care for the earth or really the ways that we have failed to care for the earth, they're a huge part of the problem that we're facing. Like deforestation and factory farms make it way more likely that a virus like this will find its way to us. Pollution and climate change make it make us less less able to fight it off. And also um, people in poverty are much more susceptible for a lot of reasons. And so when we look around our city and around the world, we should ask, how are we caring for the poor? Um, I'm not saying that God has sent coronavirus as a judgment and I'm definitely not saying it's individual. Like if you get it, that's because you have a problem. Um, 
I want to talk about the collective. It seems like God has created the world to work this way. Like if we break it, if we mistreat it, if we allow people to become destitute, then this world becomes less habitable for us. It's not a direct line like one sin, one consequence, but there is a connection. The same thing is happening with the natural disasters that are getting worse and for the forest fires raging, right? Climate change is wreaking havoc. In Genesis, it says that we were put here first of all to care for the garden that God has made. So should we lament or should we also repent? I saw a sign the other day that said, the climate is changing, why aren't we? Every year, uh, the Global Footprint Network calculates Earth Overshoot Day, which is the day when they say humanity has exhausted nature's budget for the year. As in, we have used all of the resources that our planet has to give us for this year. And after that day, we are now borrowing from future years, depleting the stores, going into debt, if you will. Um, this year, Earth Overshoot Day was August 22nd. So now the resources that we are using are making withdrawals from our children. And particularly, they are making withdrawals from the poorest of the poor. They are the people who will suffer the most. So do we need to just lament? Or do we need to repent? I think both. And we could say the same again about racial tensions right now, right? Like I, as an individual, have not actively oppressed anyone as far as I know. Uh, but what I am learning more and more is that I benefit from a racist country, that I participate in racist structures and white supremacy, often without knowing it, often blind to my own contributions. And the more I learn, the more I see how racism and prejudice are in me in some devastating ways. Even as I long for people to be liberated, I am part of the problem. I need both lament and repentance. Joel says, rend your hearts, not your garments. Um, then to tear your clothes, to rend your garments was an outward sign of remorse or of grief. And Joel's saying, like, that's not enough. You need to go deeper than just the show. Um, I think both of these areas, climate and racial justice, and there are lots more that we could talk about, they are areas where we often rend our garments and not our hearts. Uh, I think that the equivalent um, of rending our garments uh, in this might be like posting on Facebook about all of my rage um, and anguish about pain that happens. And maybe like learning all the right words to make sure that everyone knows that I'm on the side of justice without ever entering into the mess of it. Like I'm sure there are lots of other ways um, that we can rend our garments without ever rending our hearts. And maybe that's worth spending some time thinking about. To rend our heart, our garment, <laughs> rather, to rend our hearts will require actual change. Um, I'm sure I've said this before, but this is one of the things that really moved me about Tony when we were dating. Um, also really irritated me because it's quite challenging for me. But, you know, he didn't know all the right words about social justice. And so uh, sometimes my like social justice savvy friends and I would look down on him because he didn't say the right thing. Um, but he actually like loved all the people. So much so that he would invite them to everything because he thought everyone should welcome them. Even the like strange people who, uh, who we left on the outside because they were strange. So he would, so we would judge him and then we would be annoyed at the outsiders who he brought into our group. It's gross. It's like a sickening kind of hypocrisy. Um, and I am still tempted toward it. I want to say the right words. You know, I want to let my virtue be known but not really enter into the difficulty of it all. If I can just talk really well about racism, then maybe that will be enough, you know? And I won't have to have hard conversations or learn my own guilt or change in any real any way. Um, I think that's the difference between renting your garments and renting your hearts. In all of this, uh, just like the Israelites, 
who might have worshipped using Joel's text, we repent, we grieve, we lament, knowing that our God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We need to remember grace in every one of these spaces. Our God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That steadfast love, that's Hesed again. We talked about it last week. It's God's love that is sturdy. I like um, Shakespeare's sonnet 116 because um, it captures that kind of love really well. He says, um, love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. That's the dependable love of our God, an ever fixed mark. And so we pray to our God, confessing our sin, crying out for deliverance, and asking to for change, knowing that our God's love will never move away from us and we can count on that. Joel looks at this plague of locusts and sees how God has delivered God's people and then lets that be the promise of future deliverance. But the future deliverance is much grander than the plague will go away. It's a restoration of all that was lost and much more. God's response, and they mentioned this in the video, but I'm going to go through these um, each briefly. God's response uh, to both the past and the future plagues is threefold. God defeats the evildoers, restores the devastated land, and promises God's own presence in new ways. Um, so first, defeating the evildoers. Uh, the part where God deals with evildoers and Joel and other parts um, of the Bible. Sorry, my foot's falling asleep. I Sit differently. Okay. Uh, the parts where God deals with the evil universe in the Bible are often just a little too violent for my taste. Uh, but honestly, I think that has something to do with me being like white and rich. Um, I have never known what it's like to be stuck in this world. Like really stuck. I'm like held down by someone else. I'm reading this book called Washington Black right now. It's a story of a man who grew up as a slave in Barbados. Listening to the hell that was slavery astounds me. I have never known anything close to it, and it's hard for me to even imagine what it would feel like to only know violence and subjugation from birth, and to expect my life to end that way as well. To have no expectation of change, no hope of kindness or rescue, I think the Black Church has some things to teach us about what it means to long for justice to be done. Now look at the reason that God's judgment comes in Joel. Joel 3, chapter 3 says, They cast lots for my people. They traded boys for prostitutes. They sold girls for wine to drink. It makes that last verse um, of the book seem so poignant. God says, Shall I, leave their <laughs> Shall I leave their innocent blood unavenged? No, I will not. That verse feels so comforting to me. I feel the protection in it, and particularly for those who have, who have known real suffering in ways that I have not. It's God's justice. It's God's justice that allows us to restrain our own desire for violent retribution knowing that God is just and that God is good and that God's love is steady even for the evildoer. I can feel confident leaving that to God, knowing that God will do a much better job of justice than I will ever be able to do, and knowing that God is committed to ending evil. It's a great comfort to me, and I, just, I don't just want evil to end out there, but in here too in my own heart, in whatever way is necessary. So that's first, the deliverance is in uh, like dealing with evildoers. And then second, uh, God's, 
God's deliverance doesn't just include people, but also includes the land and the animals. Throughout the Old Testament, there is this there is a concern for the land. Uh, it often seems like it's just about the prosperity of the people, uh, but then it also goes beyond that. Um, most of the ecological language in Joel, and there is a lot, uh, is about restoring food-bearing plants and you know grapes for wine. So prosperity for the people. But then in chapter two, verse 22, it says, do not be afraid, you wild animals, for the pastures in the wilderness are becoming green. God's love is so big. Isn't it fabulous to know that it doesn't, that it extends beyond just us? And then the third part of deliverance is the promise for God's presence in new ways. Uh, this one feels like it's the hardest to grasp or to put language to. We understand the first two because they are a little bit more tangible. We don't know a world without war or fear or lies, and we don't know a world where creation and humanity are at peace with one another, but we catch glimpses of that goodness uh, in you know moments of intimacy we experience, in sunsets and a walk through the forest. And so we can still know something of what to look forward to as that deliverance comes in full. Um, it is the same with our relationship with God. If you have known the presence of God in prayer, in worship, in discernment, in choosing something that is difficult but good, um, those are moments of clarity. They are uh, glimpses for you to hang on to. But they're just tastes of what is to come, and we need to let them feed our imaginations. Paul says, now we see in a mirror dimly, then we shall see face to face. What will that be like? When the writer of Joel uh, wrote these words of restoration, they were intended for the people of Judah. That seems pretty clear in the text. But, but in the hands of the New Testament writers, that vision expands. Um, Joel 2 says, I will... Uh, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Maybe you recognize that section of Joel from Peter's sermon in, on Pentecost in Acts 2. Peter sees Pentecost as the fulfillment of Joel's vision of the spirit falling on all people. But even then, he still only understands it to be for Israel. It takes the Spirit's movement through the rest of the book of Acts to convince Peter and Paul and the rest of the church that all people really meant all people, including the Gentiles. So later on in Romans 10, Paul will again quote from Joel 2, uh, making the argument now from this text that there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles. He says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a quote from the same section. And so we learn a little bit about reading the Bible here about and about how God moves, what Joel meant for Judah in the hands of Peter and Paul and the Holy Spirit becomes a call for all people. And so then the words of Joel do become this vision of the cosmic restoration that the Bible Project video talks about. Peter and Paul's reading of Joel allows us now to hear it as a promise for the defeat of all kinds of evil, for the renewal of the whole of creation, and the promise of all of the fullness of God's presence dwelling among us. And that makes it the perfect beginning for Advent. Joel sees the deliverance that has happened in the past as a sign and a promise of greater deliverance to come. And that promised deliverance is even greater than he knows even as he writes the words. And that, that parallel of past and future is exactly what we hold in Advent. In Advent, we look forward to Christmas, right? Which is actually a looking back to a deliverance that has already come. That God would be born among us to be with us in new ways, to deliver us from our guilt and also from the power of sin and death, that we might return to God that we might know God and have our hearts return to love, even in the midst of a death-dealing world. And we hold that past event in one hand during Advent, and in the other, we also hold all of the ways that we still long for deliverance. 
that we long for the work of Jesus to find its fulfillment overtaking this world. That evil would be no more. That the land and animals would flourish and us along with them. That knowing God, dwelling with God, would be as knowing someone face to face. We hold both of these in Advent, allowing what has already happened to feed our hope for what is to come. That what we have seen before, in creation, in the Exodus, in Christmas, in the cross, on Pentecost, our God will continue to pour out more and more of God's self until we are wholly taken up in it. Our God is present with us and still coming. We have seen Christ come already in the vulnerability of an infant. We have seen that Jesus extends the love and welcome of the cross. We have known the movements of the Spirit in our own hearts. And that God, who has already come in all of these ways, will come again and again until all things are set right, until God's dwelling place is fully and finally among God's people, until God wipes away every tear from our eyes, until there is no more death or crying or mourning or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Christ will come and will come again because he is making, sorry, let me say that again. Christ has come and Christ will come again because he is making all things new. Please pray with me. God who is present here with us now and God who is still coming Please move us to repentance in whatever ways we need. Please come to us with deliverance. Let us know your world is healed and whole. And until that day, may we be part of your um, restoration of all things. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.